The Absolute Basics of the Christian Faith Question 1. Who is God? The Trinity is one of the most important theological ideas ever, but it gives people panic attacks when they think about it. So this talk will give you the very basics of what you need to understand what the Trinity is and why it matters so much. The key idea behind the Trinity is this. God is three things, but also still one thing. God is three persons who have existed for all eternity, equally powerful, wise, and good, and they've always depended on each other. There's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit existing together in perfect harmony as one God. So how can this be? How can you have three things that exist perfectly together? It's a bit of a head-scratcher, but here's the thing. If you can understand a tiny bit about how music works, you can understand the basics of the Trinity. So find a piano uh, and pick any white key and put your thumb down on it. Then skip a white key and put your index finger on the next one. Then skip one more and put your middle finger on the next white key. Now press down your thumb, then your index finger, then your middle finger, and boom, there's a harmonic chord. There are three distinct sounds that all exist together in perfect harmony. Three things that are also one thing. The threeness and oneness here work together perfectly. This gives us a bit of a picture, uh, more accurately, a sound of what God is like. There's one God, like the one chord, with three persons, like the three notes, all existing in perfect harmony forever. Now, unlike the chord that you might have played, which came into being and then ceased to exist, the three persons of the Trinity have always existed. They've always existed in a relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father has always been Father to the Son. In fact, you can't be a Father without a Son. The Son has always been Son to the Father, and they've always been unified in the love of the Spirit. What this means is that the most basic fact about all reality is loving relationship. Before there was a world, there was a family, the family of the triune God. So when you get into the very bottom of things, the root of all reality, there's love. C.S. Lewis, in his book Mere Christianity, makes a very interesting point out of this. He writes, all sorts of people are fond of repeating the Christian statement that God is love. But they seem not to notice that the words God is love has no real meaning unless God contains at least two persons. Love is something that one person has for another person. If God was a single person, then before the world was made, he was not love. So the fact that God is perfectly loving requires that God is relational. And but the opposite is also true. The fact that God is relational requires that God is perfectly loving, and here's why. If God is triune, then we know that God is love, um, because you can't have three people existing for all eternity in harmonious relationship if they aren't perfectly loving. Imagine, for instance, existing for all eternity with your brothers and sisters, or even with your friends. Eventually, you get in some fights. But the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity, they don't fight. We know, therefore, that God is love because God is triune. We know that God is triune because God is love. So the Trinity is this perfect loving relationship that's always existed. One God and three persons. And because the Trinity is one God, the persons work together in everything they do. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus says that we are to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because the entire Trinity is at work in everything God does and at work in saving us, the whole Trinity has to be named as we are made part of Christ's body through baptism. But it's not just baptism. All throughout the story of Jesus, we see all three persons of the Trinity at work. There's a pattern. The pattern is this. The Father is the source of everything, and he sends the Son into the world in the power of the Spirit. We see this, for instance, in Jesus' birth in Luke chapter 1. By the Holy Spirit, the Son of God is born into the world. The Father sends the Son in the power of the Spirit. We also see this in Jesus' baptism. The Son carries out the mission of the Father in the power of the Spirit. Jesus goes down in the water and ascends, and the Father proclaims his approval of the Son, and the Spirit descends and sends Jesus out into the wilderness and on into ministry. We see this also in Jesus' blessing of his disciples when he ascends. When the Son goes back to the Father, he sends the Spirit to empower us. So we see this in the birth, and the baptism, the blessing of Jesus. We see this all throughout. The Father is the source and goal of our salvation. Jesus is the way back to the Father, and the Holy Spirit is the power to get there. If you want, you can imagine it a bit like this. The Father is the one who says, let there be light. The Son is the one who goes and flips on the light switch. The Spirit is the electricity that powers the light bulb. The Father is the source, the Son is the way, the Holy Spirit is the power. 
Another way you might want to think about this, if you're still trying to get your head around the Trinity, is to imagine yourself kneeling and praying the Lord's Prayer. We're praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Imagine yourself kneeling and praying the prayer. Now imagine Jesus standing beside you, teaching you to pray. We begin by praying, though, our Father, just like Jesus prayed. And so Jesus is helping us to have right relationship with the Father. Now imagine that the Holy Spirit is inside you, which he is, giving you the power to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Jesus is beside you, the Father is above you, the Spirit's inside you, all working to give us right relationship with God. Father's the source, Jesus is the way, Holy Spirit is the power. Now all this might seem a little bit mysterious and complicated, but the nice thing is that once you start looking for the Trinity, once you understand it a little bit, you see it everywhere. So for instance, the very words of the Apostles' Creed, we see that they are shaped by the Trinity. We begin with the Father, we move to the Son, and then we end with the Spirit and the Spirit's area of work, which is empowering the church. Father above you, Jesus beside you, Spirit inside you, there you go, there's the Trinity.